before I get started, I just want to give a shout out to Jim's wife, uh, owning Bunk Cakes. I'm a gluten-free person, and they just introduced a new flavor about a month ago, which is fantastic. So if she wants to send a bunch of them to my house, that would be awesome. I can get my address out there to you. Um, but that's for another time. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel that we're going to be talking about right now. I've got uh, Vipul coming out from uh, uh, ADP. Um, Vipul? I've got uh, Jason uh, Ballard from Toyota. And then uh, uh, Suda uh, Sorvanavidia from uh, uh, Deloitte. So in, in today's uh, panel that we're going to be going through, you, you heard um, uh, Sanjeev talk earlier a little about the platform engineering aspirations and the, the velocity it can create in an organization if you have common standards. And then Jim came back out and talked about this gap between um, the capabilities that those tools provide for us, but the reality that we deal with, is, which is a lot of technical debt and uh, uh, compliance and other things that we have to manage within an organization. And he had like a red zone in there. T today's conversation is really how these three individuals and their organizations, how do they deal with that balance of, uh, of aspirations and the reality of operations and that red zone that we're talking about and how they try to bend that curve up a little bit higher than most would be able to do at this point in time. But before we do that, I thought I'd let each one of them introduce themselves and tell them, tell you a little bit about what they're doing. And uh, we'll start with, uh, with you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chris. So uh, Vipul Narwith, I'm, I'm actually currently, since uh, July 1st, um, on the bench, uh, retired, living, living the same life as you, Chris, yeah. right now. Um, I spent eight and a half years at ADP most recently. I was uh, our global CIO for half that time, and then for the other half of the time, uh, head of product development for the largest product in the company. Uh, but right now, I'm doing some ad advisory work and sitting on a, a couple of volunteer boards. Perfect. Jason? Hey, good morning, everyone. Jason Ballard. I'm with Toyota North America, just a few hours north of here in uh, Plano, Texas. I've been with the company going on 22 years, and I'm 90 days into a new role in the business, where my previous 21 and a half years were all in technology with the ability to you know, serve in a variety of different roles and be a part of a lot of major transformations. My role now in, in the business is a part of supply chain management, where I'm responsible for our demand and supply operations. And then we've got a fantastic endeavor going on for our supply chain and fulfillment transformation, where we're looking to make Toyota the planet's most iconic supply chain uh, by focusing on being customer uh, customer-centered, people-led, and tech-enabled. Uh, so it's been a, a whirlwind and a little bit of a breath of fresh air over the last 90 days getting into that uh, new function. Nice, nice. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Suda Suvarna. I have the privilege of working for Deloitte um, as the, the solutions leader. Um, what that really means is I get to support all the lines of businesses, audit, uh, audit and uh, advisory, tax, consulting, and all the enabling areas that we call it as a back office systems. Um, so it's, it's a very large global organization, as you can imagine, $70 billion in uh, revenue. Um, one of the things that we are focused on is how does the future of work looks like? So every line of businesses that we have, there is some type of a transformation program going on to figure out how does our work life looks like in the next five, 10 years. And there's been a, a lot of emphasis on, on that portion. Plus, from a technology perspective, generative AI has become a normal, common staple now. And uh, we have uh, dabbled with a lot of new technology that comes along. So it's a, it's a fun time to be around when we have all this new technology that is coming our way and trying to figure out how do we go faster than before is what we're here to talk about. Yeah. Uh, Suda, you, you talked a little bit about what does the workforce look like in five years, um, and as you're thinking through that, wh where do you get inspiration around what the art of the possible might look like to shape that vision for you guys? I, I would say um, both top down and bottom up. I think there, are, there, is a, there is an importance in looking at your business from a strategic perspective. How does this look like? Because we are a traditional organization where we are, you know, um, at time, times, uh, you know, you, uh, you, uh, hourly rate and all of that, that paradigm is probably going to shift. 
So the question is, how does that look like before it gets subjected to on us, right? I think that's something we are working on. And, and the, uh, the most important thing is we hire a lot of new, um, fresh college grads from all around the world. I have teams in 15 different countries. Uh, we have a listening sessions and town halls and all of that. We actually get those inputs from them to look like, what does it look like? What is, what is it that you're being taught? Um, I graduated <laughs> eons ago. <laughs> so my knowledge is probably limited. So the question is, how are we going to get all of that? Plus, at the same time, we do a lot of hackathons. We do a lot of um, alpha labs that we call that just to make sure that we have an avenue for people to experiment on new technologies, new processes, and new tools and all of that. So it's, it's a continuous thing, you know, and uh, my mantra is, you know, good enough should never be good enough. Mm, got it, got it. Um, you know, Jason, dur during the, the pandemic, the, the chip shortage became a huge issue for a lot of manufacturers and, and from your business and all of our businesses, IT, is, is a big part of it, but if, if something's not working, you're not shipping cars, and you've got this dichotomy that we have around in, in innovation as well as operation. I mean, how, how are you dealing with the systems that run the business from the past and the tech that associated with it? Are you doing anything interesting in that, uh, that particular space? Yeah, Chris, I mean, I think, um, you know, much like Sandeep said, like, you know, a lot of our focus is on transformation and no longer thinking about, uh, living on our back-end systems and our um, aged legacy systems. It's like, how do we think about the emerging technologies? How do we apply those in various situations across our entire enterprise? We've got transformations going on in our quality areas, our manufacturing areas, in addition to the supply chain area that I'm in now. And it's funny you bring up the, the chip shortage because that was actually the transformation that we're on. We're about two plus years into this five-year business case. We know transformations never end. Right. Uh, but in this constraint of the original business case, one of the first things we did was brought in a lot of AI ML models, and we looked at uh, our simulation around our demand and supply forecasts. And actually, that was almost a billion-dollar impact that we had inside of Toyota by using our sim engine product to actually give us scenarios where we could shift where we didn't have shortages to, to push different vehicle models forward. Mm. And it really, um, really saved Toyota a lot uh, of money, but also allowed us to uh, you know, address our customer needs in a big way when a lot of other OEMs weren't able to do so. Right, right. Uh, and that's just the, the power of leaning into the technology. That's great, that's great. Um, Vipul, you were talking, uh, when we were having breakfast earlier, you, you said something that was very interesting to me you have some sort of a process where you're meeting with uh, strategic partners on a, on a basis. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit more around that and how that's influencing you know, your, your, your direction? Absolutely, so one, one of the things that uh, I was doing in, in this last year was um, every first Friday of every month, I would have um, a couple of companies, two or three companies come and present to me uh, of what they're doing, various different things, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it was testing tools in the DevOps space or um, data tools, all, all sorts of uh, new technologies. Some of them, um, I was interested enough that I said, hey, I've got a team here, go talk to my team, let's start doing a POC on that, and, uh, and then see how we could use it for ourselves. Others of them, I was just giving feedback to the companies where it's like, yeah, you know, here's where you're missing the idea, or it is a really good idea, you're just two years too late, mm. <laughs> you know. Um, and, and right now, your idea is great. However, do you realize that in six months, if you're not keeping pace with how AI is coming out, how Gen AI is coming out, will your product even be valuable in, at that time? Or do you need to start making that pivot and that shift right now? Right. Uh, that was for a, a way for me to stay on top of um, new technologies coming out, get first look at some of these things, and uh, the really cool ones. Um, and then the ones where I could have Here's innovation and here's the impact, right, that, that we would have, and, and I could pull them in. And then internally with my own teams, we would do this too, to, to hold a, a, a town hall uh, three times a year or four times a year. And in each one of those town halls, what my teams, different teams around the world had been doing, they would all nominate projects that they'd done from an innovation and impact uh, perspective. So the innovation wasn't enough. It's like, well, how did that impact something, mm. right? So much like in your case, like, well, that's a cool idea, but is it actually gonna 
cost us a billion dollars or save us a billion dollars, right? Is that actually going to generate some revenue or not? So we, we would then <clears throat> judge these things on, on, on the impact um, and, and then, uh, you know, recognize these teams and, and uh, just basically have everyone be able to, to give them a pat on the back and saying, oh, that was really cool. You were, you know, this quarter, you guys were the, you know, you two teams were the innovation and impact uh, winners. Yeah, I, I think you're being a little bit humble there. If I understand right, those winners got a fantastic trip with their spouse and uh, yeah, yeah, so. got a chance to interact <laughs> with some others. That, that helps a lot. Um, you know, Jason, we talked a lot about you know, you know, our, our, work, our teams have a lot of day-to-day -day responsibility, not a lot of discretionary time uh, in, in their day. Um, if you're wanting them to do more of these innovation and transformation type of things, how are you preparing the workforce to be able to live in that, that world, right? They have day-to-day -day responsibilities, but you also want them to apply their time in a more innovative way. Is there anything you guys are doing in that, that arena? Well, you know, we try to set aside a few days each quarter um, to give them some space to, to incubate some ideas that they may have that aren't coming up in the backlogs of our various products that we're trying to advance. That's, that's worked really positively uh, because, again, it may be from an engineering standpoint, there's something that they're dealing with in the data ops or the ML ops pipelines that they just know is a pain and they want to be able to adjust it and they can go address that when it maybe doesn't get the priority of, mm. of from an enterprise view or just other tools or maybe even it's a customer feature or an enhancement that uh, somebody wants to deliver. We give them that freedom to kind of come up with those and, and spend again just a few days each quarter um, you know, to deliver. And it's again proven some really good results. It's, it's hard to to be consistent because again, at the end of the day, they do have their day-to-day -day responsibilities. So it's something that needs to build momentum over time. You really gotta take those stories, those examples, and you gotta tell them right. to everybody in, across the teams, across the programs, right? To, to say, hey, we allowed this to happen and look what came out of it. To get people to really say, okay, I can get some break from my day-to-day -day and, and my leadership will give me that shelter or coverage to go do such a thing, that's when I think it can really magnify. Kind of a trustful kind of thing. I think bit. so. Yeah. Um, on that same line, so you mentioned the, your Alpha Labs, and, and I think we talked about a, an insights periodical you publish on an annual basis. I think it feeds into what Jason was saying. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about bringing visibility to the great things that are happening by the individual contributors? Absolutely. Um, it basically started with me asking a question when I joined the firm, where is our incubation lab? Um, and basically, after that, we actually came up with this concept called Alpha Lab. It is not random. You just don't go and experiment on the random thing that has no value add on the back end. So what we did was we started with the scanning the marketplace. We used the gardeners, um, the magic quadrant for the, the technology that we care about. And then we combined that with the Deloitte Insights that we publish on an annual basis. And we started looking at the intersection of both and try to figure out, okay, what does that look like? So we called it as an innovation barometer. That became the starting point for all of our innovation. So then we said, okay, of all the things that's on this chart, what are, what are, what are some of the investment that's gonna have the biggest return on investment? And our biggest outcome that we can say we delivered to the business, right? So once we started doing that, uh, the culmination of that was creation of um, uh, big bets. Every year we make big bets on two or three things that is relevant, modern, and also keeps our people excited about doing some of the Alpha Labs. Alpha Lab in general is just like, it costs less than $25,000, $30,000. Mm. And you can do that within less than six weeks. That was the, the parameter that we had established. Um, and you know we are also, um, using something called innovation index to track the impact of our uh, the minimal investment we are making across multiple businesses, right? So as a result, now it has become part and parcel of the culture. Of course, we do the uh, hackathon at least two or three times a year in different parts of the world. Uh, that also creates all the excitement and you know uh, generates a lot of uh, um, enthusiasm amongst our people. But overall, you know, I, I call it as a six times, six ways. You know, don't, don't just look at one aspect and keep just doing that because it yields some type of a result. But look at it from a six times, six different ways to figure out, okay, we're gonna try everything possible. But some of, sometimes it is 
uh, finance becomes constrained, right? So we are like, how, would, how do we fund all this stuff? That's where the creation of the efficiency comes in play, and um, we try to generate as much as possible from the efficiency to fund all of these things that we say we're going to do. So I heard there's creativity. What's that? I heard the creativity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, if you if you get a chance to see his annual letter, it is it's very impressive. We got to walk through it a little bit earlier, and it it really did a good job of showcasing what the organization's doing, and um, kind of think help helped other people in my mind realize that if you if you take that step, the organization will will support you and, and celebrate you along the way, which I thought was good. Yeah. Um, one one other last question here, you know, there's um there's this whole emergence of the citizen developers, right? Everybody. Can, can go to a chat GPT or whatever, and, and it's making it uh, easier for everyone in the organization, which is, it's good and bad. It, it, it's great that you have this extra capacity, but it can be, it can be chaos if not controlled. Um, I'll, I'll ask it to anybody. I mean, how are you harnessing, or are you harnessing that, that extra capacity that's buried in the different organizations that are out there that uh, historically we try to stop and shut down, but we've got to really. You know. I can start with that. Look, there's, I think, the first word to me that comes in that is, is, is complexity. And, and the reason I say complexity is because on the one hand, you've got the citizen developers who can go do their own thing. On the other hand, if the left hand isn't talking to the right hand, you could have some serious problems, mm. right? So, um, at the, you know, RPAs, robots, these are, you know, these are still the rage, right? They're still out there, there's a lot of it going on. And, and they're getting with, you know, a little bit smarter, I'd say, with, with more and more capabilities in, into them. And, and I love the model you talked about with, with, with the RPAs, actually giving them personalities. Uh, but with that being said, a, a lot of these bots that go in, they help the business move fast, and they're great. Uh, however, if they sit around too long, they're actually holding innovation back. Mm -hmm. They're actually making you more indebted to technical debt than helping you move forward. Right. And so we had done, uh, and, and we had to put this in place because we had a couple of big incidents where the bots blew up and they stopped working and like operations for you know, a number of hours or maybe a day came to a halt. And why? It's because on the dev teams, we were actually enhancing the system. We released some new capabilities, some new features. The bot was still working on the old capabilities and the, 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 the two didn't talk and mm. we didn't know about those bots, mm. right? So we put a governance structure into place where you could say, what are you trying to get done? By the way, that's something on our roadmap, don't build a bot. Oh, that's not on our roadmap, build that bot. We're gonna deprecate that functionality in a year so your bot's got a one year lifespan, mm. right? This isn't an, a forever bot. It's gonna be around for six months, a year, 18 months. What's the lifespan of your bot? And it's only if we can't get it done otherwise. Right. Right, and, and, and that's what we had to go do. And, and, and I know Suda, you had, Similar examples. Yeah. Do, do you have something? Go ahead. ahead. I'll, I'll add some okay. Um, in fact, uh, we kind of realize this whole uh, citizen development, uh, it, it's, um, it's here to stay. So the, then the next thing you have to ask yourself is what is our posture in supporting uh, citizen development in a controlled way that does not harm um, the firm? in any way, shape, or form. So that's why the governance comes in play and whatnot. So a few years ago, we actually came up with the technology operating model. That technology operating model pretty much defined all the important things that we care about. There are about 20 different um, uh, controls and standards. We said, if you're building an asset for the firm, you need to meet all this requirement. And that was not an exception. And actually, that helped us to partner with them in the beginning to figure out how exactly they're gonna build those assets that meets all the criteria and standards that we have. That actually helped us to make sure that everybody comes up to par with what was going on. Otherwise, we would have had a few headline news by now, mm -hmm. right? Then the question was, okay, how do we partner further? Because some of the data owners are sitting in the business. So they don't need to give anybody else the permission because they can give the firm. If I'm the CFO, I can give the financial data uh, access to some of the people that are ask, asking for the data, right? Um, in our case, we are trying to figure out, okay, where is that intersection where we can actually be of help to them and bring out, you know, the, the risk factor, the financial factor, because um, as you know, things get pretty mm -hmm. crazy and um, uh, expensive. 
So that partnership is working really well. Now the question is, how do we make sure that it doesn't get out of control? Because everybody, when you start generating some new data through Gen AI, for example, um, where does it go? Where does it sit? What is the governance for that? I guarantee you none of the business will be thinking about that because ontologically they are not trained to do that. We are, right? So that's why we actually come up with some guardrails to make sure we are not coming across as cops but as partners mm. to safeguard what we care about. And I was just going to say that if we think about the theme of velocity, I think the citizen development is a great tool for accelerating that digital acumen that you want to get yeah. developed in the business, right? As somebody, again, that just made that leap, it's not, it wasn't that big of a leap for me coming from the technology side, and you see that there's a lot of business members that are very inept and up to speed on, on what the capabilities are of technology, and I think those lines between a, like your centralized IT model and the business having their own separate roles and responsibilities are of the past, and they're going to be more and more uh, bridged together, right? Of course, there'll be certain horizontal services always come from a technology yeah. Uh, division, but I, I think that citizen development in agreement with their points on how to you need to manage it and guardrail it. But it's really helped us inside Toyota to again give them uh, education and awareness to what's possible. Mm -hmm. Especially, I hate to admit it, when you've got a company that uh, maybe a sector that still is heavy Excel driven in a lot of our processes. Uh, so it's a great first step, and then you pair that with some of the capabilities of generative AI. Uh, and being able to, in the areas of like predictive maintenance, or in our case, we're building a brand new battery plant in North Carolina, so you've got uh, a whole new way of production happening, and you've got new people that first time being in the battery production area, generative AI solutions to help them understand what do you do when this equipment gives you this error message, or you know how to be prepared for preventing an outage right. by doing some predict, you know, some uh, forward thinking and forward maintenance. So. That's how we are kind of looking at the citizen development opportunity. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I, I think what you heard today across three very different business lines, whether it's uh, data and analytics and human capital or hardcore manufacturing or consulting services, the reality is every one of our businesses and every one of our industries is going through this chasm uh, that we talked about as that red zone. Um, I think you've heard you know, three different uh, uh, leaders talk a little bit about the people side and how you measure that up with um, the technology. Acknowledge that there's got to be creative ways to create uh, space in people's calendars and celebrate some of the successes and allow them to kind of innovate in their own backyard in some cases to, to free up more of their time. And I think if they, if they see how these, these ideas are recognized and celebrated, it gives them a lot more courage to go and find those those things that they know more than anybody because they do them on a regular basis on how they can apply their time and free up more time and, and then do more interesting stuff um, and, and just um, have, have a much more exciting path. So um, hopefully this resonates with some of you and, 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 and you know, just acknowledges where you're at, right? There's, there's no magic bullet on this. There's some creative ideas that you heard and hopefully you're doing some of them as well and, and maybe you'll bump into some of these, these nice gentlemen this afternoon and. Uh, can pick their brain a little bit more. But uh, with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap up this session and uh, we'll move on to uh, getting Brian back out here. Right, thank so you thank you very good. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.